all that the Lord has said, <laughs> uh, we will do. Uh, James chapter 2, let's go there first. James chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 10. James chapter 2 and verse 10. Can you hear me okay? James chapter 2 and verse 10. And so the Apostle James declares, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and notice the deliberate use of language by the Apostle James. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of, he is guilty of all. For he that saith, do not, are you not there? Do not commit adultery. You said also, do not. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, James says you are become a transgressor of the law. And he concludes this thought in verse 12 by saying, so speak ye, and so do. As they, in other words, speak, uh, talk, and behave, as they that shall be judged by what? By the law of liberty. And there's a few things we can notice about the verse. Uh, James says you can keep part of the law, but if you break, you, you could keep the majority of the law, but if you break part of it, then you're still a sinner. Why? Uh, because to God, the law is holistic. And then James says, listen, whether you kill or you commit adultery is the same to God. <laughs> and, and, and he says, in light of this, you better speak and behave as one who's being judged. And of course, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe, uh, based upon the word of God, that this judgment began in October 22nd, 1844. In fact, the last time I was here, that's what I spoke to you about. But notice what James says in verse 12. James says that the law is a law of what? Of liberty. Now, let me ask you a question. When you think about law... What's the first word that comes to your mind? Constraints. <laughs> you said the same words together. Anyone else? I can't hear you. Police. Po police. <laughs> That's a good one. Anyone else? What comes to your mind when you hear the word law? Restrictions. Control. Anything else? Restrictions. Anything else? But, but, but notice... In James' eyes, and of course it's God's eyes, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, James is just the vehicle that, that, that God used to pen these words. In God's eyes, the law is not a law of restriction. <laughs> it's a law of liberty. Uh, the law, my sister, is not a law of burden. <laughs> but it's a law of freedom. In God's eyes, at least. The law is what sets us free. Amen. But the way the devils put it, remember my subject is what you promised, and, I, and my main text is all that the Lord has said. That's what we're going to do. And so, so, so the devil puts it in a way that makes the law, makes the, the keeping of the law seem burdensome. Am I right? You can testify in your own life. And sometimes it seems, in fact, oftentimes it seems that what God wants us to do is not as good as what we want to do. Sometimes it seems as though the thing that God prohibits and the thing that God uh, disallows us from doing is the best stuff. And that's a trick of the devil. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me ask you a question in my example. Uh, say there was an, an individual 
that went out into Battersea and, and, and around the park and wherever it may be. And they stole and they, they, they committed all sorts of crimes. They beat people up and all that stuff. Uh, do you naturally expect them to be imprisoned or to be free? You expect them to be imprisoned. Because breaking the law, listen to me, it imprisons you. But say there was another person. Now this person, they went out and, and they were what we call a law-abiding citizen. Uh, what do you expect to happen to them naturally? Do you expect them to be imprisoned or to be free? As it is in the natural, <laughs> so in the spiritual. By keeping the law of God is how we obtain freedom. Amen. And not through breaking it. And so the prophet Ellen White says, in the book, Page House and Prophets, I believe it's page 33. Uh, she says, the law of love being the foundation of the government of God. The happiness of all intelligent beings, listen to this word, depends upon their perfect accord with his great principles of righteousness. Uh, the prophet says this. She says that there is no other way to be happy but that you keep the law. She says it depends upon it. It's critical. It's crucial. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings, depends upon their perfect accord with his great principles of righteousness. But the enemy comes to us like he came to Eve, and he says that keeping God's law restricts us. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. In fact, before we go there, let me go to Revelation 12. Uh, notice that in Revelation 12, we, we know about the war. Am I right? In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, uh, the apostle, the prophet John says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore for them in heaven. And uh, they were cast out. And I look at verse 9. John now describes the enemy. Uh, can you help me? How does he describe him? What does he say? That, that, what, what, how does he start? How does he start? And the, come on, let's read the verse properly. And the great dragon, that, that old serpent, called the... And what else? What happened to him? He was cast out from... To where? Notice this with me. When John wants to describe the, the, the how nefarious and how wicked and evil the devil is, he uses the phrase, that great serpent. Why? <laughs> because John is taking us back. And let me ask you a question. What does the Bible have anything to say about a serpent? Oh, you shouldn't be quiet, church. I said, does the Bible have anything to say about a serpent? And so John now, and where is that found? John is taking us back to Genesis. John is trying to say to us, in order, and this is true of the Bible, in order to really understand what I'm describing in Revelation chapter 12, you must go to Genesis chapter 3. Because the old... It reveals uh, the old, depicts, and, uh, 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 and, and helps us to understand the new. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 3, and we want to read verse 1. Well, it will begin in verse 1, I should say. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Are you there? Moses here is writing, and he says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not what? You shall not eat of the what? Of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the, in the midst of the garden. God has said. Who said it? 
Oh, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you what? And the serpent said unto woman, you shall not, <laughs> you shall not surely die. Uh, this verse here is, is, is so powerful, these few verses, and I'm going to continue to verse 6 soon. They're such powerful verses because the enemy in the form of a serpent, he comes to the young lady, Eve. And, and he said, Yea, hath God said. In, in other words, did God really say it? Did God really say? There's a, there's a young man I saw from a certain country in a certain place. And the brother has now left Adventism. And he's teaching all sorts of erroneous and foolish doctrines. And his strategy to his people on YouTube and Facebook and wherever his sphere of influence extends to is to doubt the validity, the validity and the veracity of the word of God. And so just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, this brother begins to ask, did God really say that? Or did he really say that you ought to remember the Sabbath day? Not just for knowledge, but for keeping holy. Uh, did he really say that? And as, the, you know what Paul said? Paul said, we are not ignorant of the wiles of the devil. In other words, uh, there, 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 there should be no trick or no surprise to us because as he did in the beginning, he will do throughout the age of human history. And it worked with Eve and Adam in the garden, and it's been working with us ever since. So the enemy comes and he, he gets the, 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 the sister to doubt. He said, yea, hath God said. It did God really say that? Not only did God really say that, but did God really mean what he said? And notice Eve's response, because this is really the crux of the thing. Notice Eve's response. She said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees which is in the where." This is the part you need. What is she going to say? Oh, you're too slow. Quickly. You shall, neither shall you touch it, what, lest you die. Notice that Eve understood who the directive came from. Eve said, but God has said. Eve said, this isn't something that Adam told me. Are you still with me? She says, this isn't something that I made up. This is something that God, that God said. And so then that declaration of truth makes the next two verses more puzzling. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. And of course, this again is the enemy's plan. And the serpent said unto him, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, what's going to happen? Then shall your eyes be what? Be open and what? And you shall be as God's what? Knowing good and evil. He said to Eve, God is holding you back from having an experience they have never had before. A God is holding you back because God knows that if you eat this food, if you eat this food, then you're going to be like God's. And so there the strategy is again that we can break the law of God to obtain a special sort of existence. Verse 4, the 
serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. The serpent began to teach and to perpetuate the idea that one can break the law of God and still live. But I've read a couple of verses. And it says that sin equals death. I read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. In Ezekiel 18 verse 20, the soul that sins, it shall die. In Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is what? In James 1.15, sin when it is finished brings forth death. The Bible is clear and consistent and therefore consistently clear that sin equals death. And my brothers and sisters, if we keep on sinning, we'll die. <laughs> it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but by God we will die. Ask Adam. Because he did not die straight away, but the word <laughs> shall not return void. He that sins shall die. And so the songwriter asks, would you be free <laughs> uh, from your burden of sin? And so the same Eve in chapter 3, verse 3, that says, God has said. Look at what she does in verse 6. Are you there? Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you know, this, I, I like to read the Bible in, 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 in small, in small bite size. Because I don't rush the thing anymore. I read it delicately and, 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 and as careful as God would, it, would, it, would enable me to. And this part troubles me. Because how is it possible that Eve could see good <laughs> in something that God forbids? God said, don't eat it. But Eve said, you know what? <laughs> that tree looks good for food. <laughs> How is it possible that we can see good in that which God has forbidden? And you see it in our lives. You see it in our churches. We are accepting as good, as acceptable, as tolerable things that God said is not good. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and the tree to be desired to make one wise. It was pleasant to the eyes. The Bible says that she took off the tree thereof and did what? And did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. But this is the same sister that said, that declared, God has said, you shall not eat it. <laughs> and so the question then is how or why did Eve go against the word of God when she knew what was expected of her? Let me take you to James as we seek to understand Eve's behavior. James chapter 1 is a very beautiful verse. James chapter 1. Are you still with me? James chapter 1, verse 21. Are you there? Now, Eve knew what God desired of her, but she still didn't do it. What does that teach you? Somebody talk to me. What does that teach you? Go on, sister. Preach the thing. Is that true? Eve's experience teaches us clearly and it's not merely enough to know what God has said. Let's look what James says. In verse 21, I believe, James says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive how? With meekness the engrafted word, which is able to do what? Which is able to save your souls. Did you know? 
that the word of God can save your soul. The prophet Elohim says, the scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of characters. If studied and obeyed, they work in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. And she quotes John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. <coughs> thy word is truth. Uh, the scriptures, I don't know if you heard the verse, the, the, the quote, but I love it so much. Because, because nothing else would save us. Nothing else that we could try, that we could attempt. Nothing else would save us but Christ revealed in the word. The scriptures, the prophet says, are the great agency in the transformation of characters. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, if you would be transformed, then study the word. Amen. If you would be transformed, then know the word. But even that's not enough. And, and, and notice, notice how James describes the, 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 the situation of the person needed to receive the word. How does he say to receive it? With what? With meekness. Because when I read the Bible, it tells me stuff that I don't like to hear. And when I read John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, I say praise him. <laughs> uh, when I read 1 John 2, 25, this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. I said praise God. But there are other parts of the Bible that demand that I become meek. Because when he says, John, <laughs> you can't do that. I want to say, who do you think you are? I want to say, like, like, like Nebuchadnezzar, who is this God? And so the Bible, when we come to the word of God, it demands from us a level of meekness and humility. And so, therefore, my brothers and sisters, when we read it, when we study it, when we hear it from the pulpit, we must not expect everything that's said to be agreeable with us. You can't expect to agree with everything that God says. You can't expect every expectation or, or every command to be pleasing to your ears. And so James says, receive it meekly. And what will happen when one receives the word? It will save your soul. But look at verse 22. In verse 21, you have to read the thing, you know, the, the word is beautiful. In verse 21, James says, receive the word of God. But he, but he says, he says, that's not enough. <laughs> he says, but be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Because Eve knew she declared God said. In verse 3 and in verse 6, the Bible says that she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Because as my sister so rightly said, and as you know from experience, it is not enough to know what God has said. One must do it. It is not to, enough to understand what God has said, that is his word. It is not to understand what God commands, that it is law. We must do it. So James says, be ye doers of the word. The prophet says, if studied and obeyed. You know, I love that word, and. Because the word and indicates that there's something else to be added. Am I right? There is something else to be added when, 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 when a parent says to a child that you ought to wash the bathroom and clean the kitchen. If the bathroom alone is washed, is that complete? <laughs> Are you happy? Because and indicates that there is something else to be added. And indicates that you can't just do one part and neglect the other. If studied and obeyed. That's how the word helps us. 
And my subject is what you promised. Eve promised to keep God's word. Did you know that? That's why she was allowed to live. (laughs) Eve promised to keep God's word, but she wasn't able to. And so my main verse in Exodus chapter 19, uh, we find the children of Israel. Uh, and, and, and God says to them in verse 3 and 4 and 5, and he begins, to, he begins to tell them that you saw how I brought you out of Egypt. I, I brought you from the land of bondage and I've, I've made you free. He said to them, if you would hearken diligently unto my voice, just listen to what I've got to say. You'll be okay. He said, you won't have disease and you won't be, you won't be captured, you won't be besieged if you just listen <laughs> to what I've got to say. And the people hear this and they say, that sounds good. <laughs> they say, we like the sound of that. And so in Exodus chapter 19 verse 8, the Bible says, and all the people answered together. There was an agreement in unison. All the people answered together and said, How much did God say? All that the Lord has said. (laughs) That's what we're going to do. We are going to do it. They promised to obey God. And, and, And of course, we see that it was an agreement. Because the Bible says, and Moses took the words of the Lord, uh, the words of the people unto the Lord. That was a way of showing that the, 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 the stipulations of their contract had been met. It was agreed upon that God would speak and the people would listen. But in Exodus chapter 32, the Bible says that they took off their earrings, their nose rings and their toe rings, their bracelets and their necklaces, and they dashed them into the fire, and they began serving other gods. And I, 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 I don't know about you, but I can hear the voice of God saying, but you promised. I hear the voice of God saying, but you promised. You promised you would obey. You promised you would love. You promised you would follow. You promised you would be faithful. But you promised. And so the question is, and, and, and the main uh, teaching of this discourse, of this sermonic discourse, of this, uh, this sermon, whatever you're pleased to call it, is to answer this question. How does one keep the promise that they've made to God? Let me show you two things and then we'll go to that question. Come me to Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. And notice that the people, they, they, they promised God that they would keep the commandments. They promised that they would listen to his voice. But they failed to do so. And notice the words of of a wise brother. His name is Solomon. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and I I want to read two verses, verses 4 and 5. Are you there? Uh, Solomon said, when thou vowest, what's a vow? A promise, an agreement, a covenant, a contract. Is that true? When thou vowest a vow unto God, what does Solomon say? Oh, come on, church, you're not with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, if you're not there, talk to me. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, what does Solomon say? What does the word defer mean? Delay. In, in, In other words, so this is the first step, sister. Solomon said, when you make a promise to God, keep it, and keep it when? Keep it now. (laughs) 
Solomon said, when thou vowest a vow, when you've made a promise or a covenant or a contract to God, keep it now. And so as we gather here today, as the Holy Spirit tells us stuff that we must vow to him, we ought not to say next week, <laughs> next year, or after one more time. We ought to decide and vow to keep it and to keep it now. And that's a warning from God, you know, when thou vowest they vow, do not delay in keeping it. But not just that. What does he say? What, what else did he say? He hath no pleasure in whom? He hath no pleasure in fools. And then he ends by saying, pay what you vowed. So two things. When you make a vow to God, be quick. But not only that, when you make a vow to God, actually keep the vow. Keep the promise that you've made. Because verse 5 is so solemn. <laughs> verse 5 says, better it is that thou shouldest not vow. Oh, it's so poetic. It's clear, isn't it? He says, better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and what? <laughs> and not care. And not keep it. It's better that we did not promise God than after we had promised to break the promise that we made. And so I can hear someone saying, we might as well not make any promises then. But if that's the way you're thinking, then you've missed the point. The point is to make your promise to God and keep it. But the question is how? Because that's all we need to know. I could have just spoken on that alone. How do we keep it? Let's end with that. Uh, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. It could be 24. Let me see. Uh, Luke 24. Luke 24. And I, and I want us to focus on verse 49. You must be there by now. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, Behold, I send the what? The promise of my whom? Of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until I, uh, un until I what? Until ye be endued with power from my hand. It, this, there was a time when I did a word study on, on the word promise. It's a fun activity to do, but it's not just fun, it's, it, it will help your life. <laughs> I did a study on the word promise. And there are a few things that the Bible calls promise. One thing the Bible calls a promise is what? A, a vow, but, 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 let me tell you. There are a few things the Bible calls promises. Primarily, there are two things. One of them, okay, let me ask you, who is he speaking about in Luke 24? Who is the promise of the Father? Are you sure? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 33. Are you there? Now, this is Brother Peter speaking. Uh, he said, therefore, being highly exalted to where? Be, be, being, being, being exalted by the right hand of God and having received of the Father the promise of what? Of the Holy Spirit. So that's just a simple, 
just putting two verses together. The promise of the Father then is whom? Is the Holy Spirit. And so one thing the Bible refers to when it speaks about promise is the Holy Spirit. But the other thing is the second coming. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter said in verse 4, he said, he said, don't worry because in the last days there will come scoffers saying, where is the, the promise of his, of his coming? The, the second coming is referred to as a promise. Uh, but Peter said, listen, don't worry about them <laughs> because they are willingly ignorant. For God is not, uh, for, but, but, but Peter, said, uh, Peter said, the fact that Christ hasn't come is because of this reason. Because he is long-suffering. He said the Lord is not slack or late concerning his. What promise is that? The promise to do what? To come back. He said God is not slack concerning his promise. But in fact he's long-suffering towards us. And the question is how long has he been suffering? My goodness. He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So the Bible calls different things promises. Go check it out. It's a beautiful study. That was a, a, a side point. Let's get back to my main point and I end up. Let me make a statement. And the statement is simple. His promise enables me to keep my promise. His promise enables me to keep my promise. Remember, that's all we, that's all we, really, we really hear in, in this discourse to, 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 to find out. How can I keep my promise to God? So that he doesn't have to look at me and say, John, but you promised. He doesn't have to look at you and say, but you promised. And you are reneging, you are breaking the promise that you've given to me. I submit to you that his promise enables me to keep my promise. The question is, what is his promise? We've seen that his promise is the Holy Ghost. And so if I were to make it even clearer by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost enables me to keep my promise to God. No wonder then. The verse says, not by power. Oh, come on, church. <laughs> it's not by might. But by what? And so then how can our prayers not be spirit of the living God? Fall afresh on me. The spirit enables me and you. As well as knowing the word to keep the word. Because we saw Eve and Eve knew what God had said. Eve lived so close. Uh, she, in fact, lived in perfection. She knew un, 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 unobstructed by other voices. She knew a true thus saith the Lord, but she still could not keep the word of God. We ought to beg and plead and cry and beseech that we receive the Spirit. So that when I say, God, I promise you this, and I promise you that I can actually do it. Otherwise, we will never, notice the deliberate use of that categorical word, never. Never be able to keep our promise. And the thing what will happen is that we'll keep failing and keep falling, and then eventually we'll become discouraged. And we'll say that God is unable to keep me from falling. But it's not God's fault. Oh, nothing has ever been God's fault. Nothing in my life has ever been God's fault. Nothing in your life has ever been God's fault. It's always been our own fault. It's always been our own reason why we've fallen. Our own reason why we've gone against him. Our own reason why we've broken his promises. It's only been us. But he says, I will send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give you power. He will enable you to do for or that which you can't do for yourself. So let me give you two conditions, then I'll finish. 
receive the Holy Spirit by asking. I think it's Luke 7 or Luke 13, Jesus said, if you being evil and you know how to give good gifts unto your children, then how much more does your heavenly father want to give you the Holy Spirit? James says, you have not because you ask not. And so my brothers and sisters, in keeping your promise to God, I encourage you simply to ask. And of course, the prophet says, prayer is speaking to God as to a friend. So we're asking through prayer. The second one is just as important. Every man has been given a measure of the spirit, but we need more, don't we? We receive more of the spirit by obeying the spirit that has already been given to us. That wasn't clear. I can see your face. I think it's Acts chapter 5, verse 22. Or in Acts chapter 5, just read the whole chapter. Uh, the apostle said that we receive, the Holy Spirit is given to those who do what? Who obey. And so to receive more of the Holy Spirit, get this, to receive more of the Holy Spirit, to obey the promises that you made, we must obey. We cannot disobey and expect more power to continue disobedience. I think I preached enough. What do you think? I'll come to you, my brother. I'll give you two minutes at the end. Let's just recap. We looked at James chapter 2. We saw that the law of God is, is, is described as a law of liberty, not a law of restrictions, not a law of burdens. We saw that the enemy comes to deceive us by saying that the law is restrictive and burdensome. We saw that although we know what God has said, we don't often keep it. And like Eve and like the children of Israel, God comes to us and said, what happened? <laughs> you promised. And we said the way that we can be, be faithful to this promise is by receiving the Holy Spirit. And we believe, we're confident that we've received the measure of the Spirit, but we need more. How can we have enough? We need more of the Spirit by asking and by obeying in the things that we already know. And so our prayer today is that the Spirit would fall on us. I wish I had time to talk about the former rain and, and the latter rain and those things. In fact, I have a sermon on our, on our YouTube channel called Caesar Bible Truth. I have a sermon called Your Feet Are Gorgeous and we talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. But my brothers and sisters, I encourage you to seek the Spirit, to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us. And I don't mean fill our bones or fill our head or, or fill our bodies. I simply mean that the Holy Spirit, that the things that the Spirit desires of us, we will do. And so that's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he says, he says, it's me that's living, but it's not really me. Because it's the Christ in me, it's the Spirit living, leaving his life out in me. So when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't mean the Holy Spirit is in my arteries and my veins. I mean, I mean when I move to the left, it's the Spirit that directed me. <laughs> I mean, when I speak to you, it's the Spirit that directed me. I mean, when I go to the shop, it's the spirit that has led me because I'm living, but it's not really me. It's the spirit through me. Amen. That's what the thing means. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we wouldn't know anything without it. We wouldn't know where to go, where to turn, what to do, how to be, who to be. We wouldn't know what's expected of us. And we, we, we're really grateful for the word. But you know, God, that we haven't obeyed. <laughs> and, and of course, I'm putting it lightly. 
We haven't obeyed you. We haven't listened to you. We haven't, uh, in fact, sometimes we haven't even cared. And there have been times when we cared, but we still didn't have the power to do what we wanted to do. In like Romans chapter 7, we say the things we want to do, we don't do. And the things we don't want to do, that's exactly what we find ourselves doing. You know our condition. You know me and you know your people. And so, Father God, we need more of the word, of course. But most of all, we need more obedience. Uh, that's the same thing you expected of Adam. Is the same thing you expect of us. Just to listen. <laughs> Just to obey. And Father God, we are saying here today, like the children of Israel, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And not just some things, not just even most things, which might be acceptable to us, but all things. And we know that we can't do this without you because we've tried before. And so we're asking, we're claiming that promise that Paul so eloquently described in Philippians 4 verse 13. We're claiming that yes, we can. <laughs> we can do all things. Through Jesus Christ, our example, who gives us the strength needed. And of course, the strength of Christ is the Holy Spirit. The strength that Christ gives us is the promise of you, the promise of the Father, to be able to keep every promise that we've made. And so, God, we are here today not because of power or because of might, but we're here begging and pleading and beseeching for the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to pray this prayer more often. Help us, Lord, to, to desire and to receive the former rain and the latter rain that we may be filled and that we may be like Christ and preach the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But most of all, help us to receive this spirit, God, that we can, uh, we can as I said before, we can uh, reflect the character of Christ and to keep your law. Father God, we know that you desire us to send Christ. And we can see the signs of times all around us. And we know that God, uh, Peter said this, Peter said it's not God's fault, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, he's waiting on you. He's just long-suffering towards us. And we thank you for that. But there must be a time when we get ready. <laughs> we can't tarry forever. There must be a time when we, when we decide to get ready on Sabbath and stay ready forever. Oh, God, may that day be today. Amen. Father God, give us a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of glory. Uh, help us to turn our eyes away from the things that were, because that's what's distracting us. It might be work, it might be relationship, it might be marriage, it might be uh, some sort of career, desire, it might be something. But as the songwriter so eloquently said, if you turn your eyes upon Jesus, then the things around us begin to look dim. My nice house looks dim, and, and my camera looks dim, and, and my work looks dim, and I'm just desiring, like John, I'm praying, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh God, fill us with that desire, because we're seven day, but we're not really Adventists. <laughs> we're not really desiring your coming. And so please, Lord, help us to receive the Spirit. It will help us to look like Jesus, and will help us to go out and spread this message that you would have no other choice but to come. Father God, you know what we pray here? It's good and well. Say amen and hallelujah and praise the Lord and we agree. But tomorrow is going to be tough. And Monday is going to be difficult. Because the stuff that we agree on Sabbath is most difficult on the other days. It's difficult on Wednesday and on a Tuesday afternoon and on a, and on a Thursday evening. That's when the test comes to us. And so the word that we have received, may the enemy not pluck it out of us. But we pray that the Holy Spirit may water that word, may make it fertile, that it may bring forth truth to the honor and glory of your name. Thank you, dear God, for hearing us. And we know that you don't only hear us on Sabbath, so God forbid we only pray now. We know that you hear us during the week. You hear us as we're walking or as we're talking. And, and may this be our experience, our experience of prayer. The prophet says, cultivate the habit of prayer of speaking with the Father when you are alone, when you are walking, when you are busy with your daily labors. Let every breath be a prayer. May that be our experience. And God, please forgive us, or we must be forgiven. Please forgive us, God, of our words and our behavior. But more than that, forgive us of our thoughts 
Because out of the abundance of the heart or the mind, that's how we behave. And so please, Lord, transform our minds. Help us to have a different mindset, a different outlook, a, a different mentality. And if our minds are transformed, then, then we'll be okay. Please forgive us, Lord. And help us, even as you've forgiven us, to forgive one another. In Jesus' name, we, we offer you these words. Amen.